Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thanks and praise to you. You have called us to be your people. You have called us into a ministry in this world. Lord, be with us as we seek your ways to fulfill your will for our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who are of a certain age may remember a time when dolls or action figures that talked were popular. Usually it involved pulling a string of some kind and then either G.I. Joe or Barbie would spout out a sentence, you know, one of a half dozen pre-recorded random sentences. For you younger ones, think of Woody and Toy Story, okay? But anyway, Rarely did those sentences have anything to do with the scenario that was being acted out. You know, little sister borrows your G.I. Joe because she wants to have a tea with Barbie there. And in that tea, the conversation goes something like this. You know, Barbie, would you like to go shopping? G.I. Joe, we must hold this position. Dig in. Which is not far off from the conversation, my response, when Diane says she wants to go shopping, you know, <laughs> dig in. Here. But in today's world, dolls have sort of gone high tech. That talking doll or action figure that your kids or grandkids found under the Christmas tree about a, a month or so ago is a lot more sophisticated. That same speech recognition technology that allows you to have a conversation with your smartphone is now found in dolls for kids to have a conversation. They can talk to a doll, turning it into a high tech version of Chatty Cathy. About a year ago at the New York Toy Fair, Hello Barbie was unveiled. Hello Barbie talked not because of a string that you could pull, but because it was connected via Wi-Fi with your computer. And with the speech recognition technology that was incorporated in Barbie, kids could hold a conversation with it. At that toy fair, uh, a CNBC reporter decided to interview Hello Barbie. And the people who heard the conversation were so amazed that many of them thought that for sure there was someone behind a curtain with a microphone answering the reporter's questions. But with such technology comes other issues. How do you know you're having a conversation with a real person? person. As speech recognition technology becomes more complicated and more sophisticated, it's going to be difficult to recognize when you're having a conversation with a real person and with a computer. So one of the skills of the future, which may already be here, is to be able to listen to the right voice. But discerning the right voice has been an issue long before there were talking dolls and smartphones. In the Bible, you find many stories of people, even children, who hear a voice and have to decide whether to respond to it. Abram was hanging out with his family in Haran when a voice came to him and said, Go west, young man. Well, the actual citation is, leave your family and your kindred and your household and go to the land I will show you. Moses was tending sheep in Nowheresville when he hears a voice speak to him out of a burning bush. Samuel was a kid, a boy, sleeping in a cot in a temple when a voice calls out his name. Isaiah was also in a temple when a voice came to him and said, Who will go for me? Whom shall I send? Elijah had hid himself in the cleft of a mountain when a still small voice comes to him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And then in our text today, the boy Jeremiah hears a voice and decides to get interactive with it. The voice he hears is that of God. But you have to wonder, 
How did he hear the voice? How did he decide to respond to it? And perhaps more importantly, how did he know it was God? With people today having more and more difficulty discerning between a computer-generated conversation and a real person, you have to wonder how Kid Jeremiah knew almost instantly that this was God talking to him. How did he know? How do we know when God is talking to us? Our text from Jeremiah gives us some clues. If you turn to your Bibles in the first chapter of Jeremiah, I think it's like 746 is the page number in the Bibles that are here at Maple. In that very first chapter of Jeremiah in verse 1, if you look through those three verses, what it suggests to us is that God's voice is best heard in a community of faith. In verse 1 sort of forms a superscription for the entire book of Jeremiah. It says that Jeremiah was a son of a what? A priest named Hilkiah. He was a PK. PKs are good people, right? Yeah, they are. And where was Jeremiah from? Anathoth. Does that town mean anything to you? Anathoth was one of the towns, it's just north of Jerusalem, just barely over the border in the region of Benjamin there. But Anathoth was one of those towns that was given to the Levites in the distribution of land in Joshua 21. Anathoth was known as a prophetic community. It had a prophet's school there. Amos the prophet was also from Anathoth. Now, that tells us that Jeremiah was raised in a context of priestly people in that community. People that, through which he would have heard the stories of Abraham, Moses, Samuel, and the others. A community in which they engaged in regular prayer. And he would witness the fellow people in the community poring over the sacred texts to determine God's will and God's way for them. Thus, when the voice of God came to Jeremiah, it didn't come out of the blue but within the context of a community of faith, a community that was devoted to discerning God's will through sacred scripture. In today's world, where our technology tends to isolate us from others, um, allowing kids to spend hours in conversation with a computer rather than family and friends, it's important to remind ourselves that even followers of Jesus discern his voice best within the context of a community of faith. It's in community that we can open up the inner stirrings of our hearts and let other people help us discern through prayer and through study of scripture if this is God talking to us or not. I mean, think about it. How many pastors in the past, or even today, are raised up from within the community of faith by someone saying to, that, to a, a guy something like, you know, have you ever thought about being a pastor? How many men, young men and women, have answered that stirring of the heart to be a, a teacher or a DCE by people within the community of faith saying to them, you have the gifts to be a teacher. You have the gifts to be a DCE. It's within this context of the community of faith that we can discern God's voice, God's will for our life. Let's move on to verses 4 to 8. In verses 4 to 8, it seems to suggest in there that God's voice is also best heard in a conversation with God. How the word of God came to Jeremiah, in, according to verse 4, we just don't know. We don't know whether it was in a dream, 
whether it was from an inner voice in his heart, whether it was through prayer, or whether it was through Holy Scripture. But like Moses and Samuel before him, Jeremiah decides to engage in a conversation with this voice, even pushing back a bit. God said to Jeremiah that he had been appointed to be a prophet to the nations even before he was born. Verse 5. But when Jeremiah heard that, he began to push back like Moses did and use the same excuse Moses did. Lord, I don't know how to speak. But then adds for good measure, I'm only a boy. I'm only a child. You think God didn't know that? You think God didn't know Jeremiah's age? Of course he knew Jeremiah's age. He knew Jeremiah's experience. But Jeremiah, growing up in a prophet's community, also knew what it meant to be a prophet to the nations. It meant a life of hardship and dislocation. The king was not going to like you. The court prophets weren't going to like you. They were going to ridicule you and berate you. They may even punish you or throw you in jail or exile you. The life of a prophet wasn't going to be profitable. But yet, within that context, and in that conversation with God, when Jeremiah pushed back, it would allow him to see whether that inner voice was coming from, or that voice of God was coming from within him, which, he could, which then could be easily dismissed, or whether that voice was actually God speaking to him, which we know cannot be ignored. Just ask Jonah. It's an interesting pattern in the Bible that God seems to use those most powerfully who engage in a conversation with God. It's not a sign of a weak faith. It's a sign of a strong faith. In fact, it's within that conversation, in a relationship, that, that enables us to grow stronger and deeper. A relationship not based on a computer algorithm, but on trust. So when Jeremiah pushes back and says, alas, sovereign God, or if you want to get more literal to the Hebrew, ah, Lord God, <laughs> that's a language that begins a prayer of complaint or a lament. You see it all over the Psalms and even in the stories of the heroes. I mean, even Jesus pushed back in conversation there in the Garden of Gethsemane. But God invites us to engage in that kind of conversation. He wants us to do that, even though he's still going to have the last word. I mean, think of how many people have said, well, God told me to do this, but then really didn't engage in conversation to check it out with God. And that thing that they told, said that God told them to do failed miserably. A computer server can spout out sentences, but only God knows the true heart of the person, his fears, her feelings. And God invites us to bring those fears and those feelings to the table in a conversation with the divine. Yes, God wants obedience, but he wants obedience based on a deep grace relationship, not on obligation. So when you engage in such a conversation, God then adds this promise to us, verses 9 and 10 that God will always supply the resources that you need. That's one of my core values. I believe that if you engage in conversation, if you listen, if you pray about it, after that point, if God wants it to happen, he will provide the resources necessary to make it happen somehow, some way. I mean, 
We all know our shortcomings. Jeremiah knew his shortcoming, that he was young, that he had no experience. God knows our shortcomings, but for God, it's not a barrier. Because you see, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. It was God who put the words into Jeremiah's mouth. It was God who saw to it that Jeremiah's mission as being a prophet to the the nations would succeed. But isn't that how God deals with us yet today? You were not some great person when God called you. You didn't have some mighty accomplishments. You weren't well trained in speech. God knew your weaknesses, and yet he still called you. He chose you in holy baptism, there washing away your sins and giving you the gifts of faith, forgiveness, and freedom. He called you and qualified you by grace to be his own, and he gives you the resources that you need to fulfill his will, to answer his call. So you see, your calling is a lot like that of Jeremiah's. Oh, you might not be called to be a prophet to the nations, but God has called you to do something. He has given you some ministry task to accomplish in this life. And he knows the weaknesses you bring. Oh yeah, we're good at still coming up with excuses. I'm too young, I can't speak, I can't do this. But for those who listen, those who engage in a conversation, those who do so in the context of a community of faith, hear God. Even if you're in the midst of a conversation with God right now, trying to figure it all out, God promises you that he is with you, that he will provide the resources to accomplish his will. You don't need to fret. You don't need to fear. You don't need to be afraid. He has called you. He has chosen you in baptism. He knows you inside and out. He will give you exactly what you need. Because after all, God always recognizes your voice. No strings attached. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us stand and make